Hey guys, I want to talk about King Abijah in the Old Testament. Now, for those of you who don't know, Abijah was one of the kings of Judah. David was the king of Israel, and he had the whole kingdom under his reign. His son Solomon became king after him, but Solomon abandoned God later in his life and began worshiping idols. So God said, I'm going to divide the kingdom. Your descendant, Solomon, will get two of the tribes, and the other ten tribes I will give to a man named Jeroboam. So, sure enough, when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became king, ten of the tribes said, we're leaving, we're going to follow Jeroboam, and two of the tribes said, we're going to continue following the king of Judah, Rehoboam, and we're going to stick with him. So the kingdom got divided. It became Israel and Judah. All right? Judah was the two tribes. Israel was the ten tribes. That's the history. Now, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, reigned for a little while, and then he died, and his son Abijah became king after him. Jeroboam was still king of Israel. All right, the story of Abijah is in 2 Chronicles 13. In 2 Chronicles 13, we read about Abijah, and it talks about how he went to war against Jeroboam. So Jeroboam, the king of Israel, is over on this side, and Abijah is over here with Judah, and they went to war against each other. Second Chronicles 13 is the only place in the entire Bible that gives any kind of summary of what happened in Abijah's life. And it talks specifically about this war. When the armies come together, Abijah stands up and he speaks to Jeroboam and his armies. And he says, You are a vast army, and you have the gold calves Jeroboam made for you as gods. You have thrown out the Levites and the Lord's priests, Aaron's sons. You have appointed your own priests as people in other countries do. Anyone who comes with a young bull and seven rams can become a priest of idols that are not gods. But as for us, the Lord is our God. We have not abandoned him. The priests who serve the Lord are Aaron's sons and the Levites help them. They sacrifice burnt offerings and fragrant incense to the Lord every morning and evening. They put the bread on the holy table and they light the lamps on the gold lampstand every evening. We obey the command of the Lord our God, but you have abandoned him. God himself is with us as our ruler. His priests blow the trumpet to sound the alarm against you. Men of Israel, don't fight against the Lord, the God of your fathers, because you won't succeed. So Abijah is basically standing up in front of Jeroboam's army and he's saying, God is with us. We haven't abandoned him. We haven't given up on him. You are worshiping idols, but we're not. We still worship God. We still sacrifice to him. We still have the, the bread and the lamps and, and we do all the things that God told us to do, but you're not doing it. Therefore, God's with us and you're fighting against him and you cannot win this battle. And sure enough, they go into battle and Abijah beats them. 500,000 people in Jeroboam's army die. Abijah crushed them. Okay, 2 Chronicles 13 is the only chapter that talks about Abijah in any kind of detail. So we read 2 Chronicles 13 and it's like, wow, Abijah was this great king. Like he worshiped God, he served God, he did what God said was right and God fought for him and they won their battle because God fought on their side. They saw God overcome their enemies because they worshiped God and their enemies didn't. However, we got to remember that Chronicles and Kings are two books that are going side by side telling the same stories. So what does Kings say about Abijah? In 1 Kings 15, we have the description of Abijah's life. However, unlike in Chronicles, where we would get this impression that Abijah was this God-fearing man who God fought on his side because he loved God and he obeyed God, unlike that, we read this description of the same man. He's called Abijam in Kings. He's called Abijah in Chronicles, but it's the same person. Abijam became king of Judah during the 18th year Jeroboam, son of Nebat, was king of Israel. Abijam ruled in Jerusalem for three years. His mother was Mekah, daughter of Absalom. 
he committed all the same sins his father before him had done. Abijam was not faithful to the Lord his God, as David his great-grandfather had been. Because the Lord loved David, the Lord gave him a kingdom in Jerusalem and allowed him to have a son to be king after him. The Lord also strengthened Jerusalem. David did what the Lord said was right and obeyed his commands all his life, except the one time when David sinned against Uriah the Hittite. There was war between Abijam and Jeroboam during Abijam's lifetime. Everything else Abijam did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. There was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. Abijam died and was buried in the city of David, and his son Asa became king in his place. So that's the entire description of Abijah in the book of 1 Kings. In Chronicles, we read about this guy who stood up against Jeroboam's army and said, we worship God, we keep his priests, we keep the sacrifices, we have the temple, we do what God wants and therefore he is going to fight for us. And we read about how God did fight for them and they defeated Jeroboam's army and 500,000 of Jeroboam's army died. Now we get this impression that Abijah was just this amazing king. But then we flip over to 1 Kings 15 and we read this description. Abijam continued in the sins of his father. He was not faithful to the Lord. And the only reason God fought for them was because of David, his great-grandfather. God had promised David that his descendants would sit on the throne for eternity. And that's the only reason he fought for Abijah. Furthermore, Jeroboam had led the people astray in worshiping idols and therefore God was fighting against Jeroboam. But Abijah didn't see things that way. He didn't see himself according to God's perspective as someone who was not faithful, as someone who continued in the sins of his father. That's not how he saw himself. We read how he saw himself in his words in Chronicles. God is on our side. We fight for God. We have the temple. We worship God. That's his perspective of himself. And God's perspective of him is he continued in sin and he was not faithful. So here's my point. It's easy for us to look at ourselves and think, God's on my side. I worship God. I praise God, I do things for God, I read my Bible, I go to church, whatever it may be. It's easy for us to look at ourselves and say, I'm on God's side, I'm his child. The problem was Abijah and the other Israelites all called themselves God's children too. It's easy for ourselves to say, I'm part of the bride of Christ, but God said all throughout the Old Testament that Israel was his bride, and yet he ended up destroying them and sending them into captivity. It's easy for us to look at what happened in the first century, what we see in the New Testament with the early church, and to think, well, we're Christians, we're part of the church, and therefore we identify with that. But the Israelites looked at what God did when he brought them out of Egypt, when he brought them through the wilderness, when he brought them into the promised land, and they identified with that, and they said, we're on God's side. It's easy for us to think that we're worshiping God and to identify with something that is not really who we are. We identify with the early church, but we don't look anything like the early church. It's easy for Christians today to be exactly like Abijah, to think we serve God, we worship God, we please God, God's on our side. But what if God's description of you is, he continued in the sins of his father and he was not faithful to the Lord. The other thing with Abijah that's important for us to recognize is that Abijah probably thought of himself as faithful to the Lord simply because he looked at this battle and he said, God fought for me. God worked miracles. We wiped out Jeroboam's army. 500,000 of his people died. Abijah probably looked at that and justified himself because he said, God's on my side. I've seen God work wonders for me. I've seen God do miracles. And I see this same thing in Christians today where they look at things in their life. They look at ways that they've seen God do things and they assume that that means God's on their side. 
They assume that means that they are justified in God's sight and that they are true Christians and that Jesus is going to welcome them into his kingdom. But Jesus even said, not all those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and did many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. Probably much like Abijah, these people looked at their lives and they were like, we prophesied, we cast out demons, we saw miracles, we saw so many amazing things. But Jesus said, I'm going to tell them, I never knew you, get away from me. You're not welcome in my kingdom. We need to make sure we're evaluating ourselves to the standard that Jesus said he will hold us to. Miracles are not what we should be judging ourselves by. Sometimes God does miracles for other reasons. Like in the case of Abijah, he worked a miracle and he gave them the victory because of Abijah's great grandfather and because of Jeroboam's sin. Abijah thought, you're fighting on my side. But really, God was doing something because of the promise he had made to David, and he was doing something because he was punishing Jeroboam for his sin. It had nothing to do with Abijah himself. There was another reason. Secondly, we see things in the New Testament, like in 2 Thessalonians 2, that the man of lawlessness is going to be able to perform signs and wonders, and that those signs and wonders will be used to deceive many people. In Revelation 13, we read about the second beast who is able to call down fire from heaven and deceive many people. So, miracles, signs, wonders, prophecy, all of those things cannot be used to determine whether or not we are truly right with God. That is not how we are told to determine whether or not we are right with Jesus. Have you seen miracles? Have you seen the sick get healed? Have you prayed for the sick and they've gotten healed? Have you prophesied? Have you spoken in tongues? Cool. That means nothing. That does not mean you're right with God. That does not mean that Jesus is going to allow you into his kingdom. That is not the measuring stick that Jesus gave you to determine whether or not you are a true Christian. We need to make sure that we're using the standard that Jesus gave us. We need to make sure that we're using the standard that God said, this is what you will be judged by, and this is how you can know whether you're a real believer or not. Miracles mean nothing. They mean nothing. Seeing God do stuff, seeing that God is doing things that look like he's on our side, doesn't mean he is. There are other possible reasons that God might do something that makes it seem like he's on your side. What standard are you using? We wrote a book called Dead Church. It's available for free for you to download on our website. And there's also a video series, which is the same thing as this book that you can go find in our playlist section. In this book or in this series, we talk about what it means to really be a Christian. What is the measuring stick Jesus gave us? Because modern Christians are evaluating themselves just like Abijah. But the apostles warned us that the church as a whole would fall away. That the time would come when Christianity is not true Christianity. What if we live in that time? What if modern Christianity is not what God wants? We need to make sure we're evaluating ourselves according to what scripture actually says, according to what Jesus said, using the measuring stick that Jesus gave us to know whether or not we will be allowed into his kingdom. Otherwise, we will be just like Abijah. We'll go through our lives saying God is on our side, we worship God, we do what God wants, we have everything in order, 
We have nothing to fear because God is for us. And then on that day, we will say, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, I never knew you. Get away from me. Find out what Jesus truly wants before it's too late. What guarantee do I have for tomorrow? But now I still have breath and the laborers are few. Will I be found? Doing his business If he said tonight Your life is demanded from you There is a number Of days written down He wrote them before ever came to be and on that last day 